Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, I cannot wait to introduce our guest to you. Uh, here's the story behind our guest. Uh, my wife and I uh, discovered intermittent fasting several years ago, and it's been very transformative to us. And uh, one of the people we followed is Jen Stevens. Jen Stevens was kind enough to incorporate us into her podcast, my wife and I, on two separate occasions. And I could not resist the opportunity to invite her on our podcast for slightly different reasons. Before I tell you about Jen Stevens, I want to uh, let you know where you are and what you're watching. You're watching Truer MU, uh, a show about becoming our true selves. If you are interested in this show, please check out some of our other interviews with uh, celebrities and with ordinary people like yourself. Please like these videos if you like them and share them. <laughs> Jen Stevens, the New York Times bestselling author of Fast, Feast, Repeat and Delay, Don't Deny, has been living the intermittent fasting lifestyle since 2014. Since then, she's lost over 80 pounds and launched her IF website, four online support groups, four self-published books, and two top-ranked podcasts, Intermittent Fasting Stories and the Intermittent Fasting Podcast. Jean Stevens, welcome to our show. Thank you. And that is an old bio. <laughs> I am no longer on the Intermittent Fasting ah. Podcast. My second one is now called Fast, Feast, Repeat. So Thank you for updating us on yeah. that. I appreciate that. And we are going to talk more about you and about your family, then we are going to talk about intermittent fasting. So if people are interested in that aspect of you, yep. I want to recommend that they go visit you. Absolutely. Yeah. But we're actually here for a different reason. Our podcast is not so much about intermittent fasting as it is about people becoming their true selves. And mm -hmm. I want you, in this case, we're talking about your family. Would you describe your family? Well, I am a wife and a mother of two sons. I have um, a 24-year-old son who is a right-brained creative child. And I have a 25 year old son. He was very left brained. He's a computer programmer. So I actually have a doctorate in gifted education and I was an elementary teacher for 28 years. So it's been fascinating to watch you know, two boys raised in the same home, 18 months apart, you know, that had all the same experiences, right. You know, grow up and be completely different as adults. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're, our plan is to talk more about the right brain son, right? Um, although we can talk about both as it goes on, but tell me a little bit more about your right brain son. Well, he, um, he has always been different from, from birth. He feels things bigger. He loves deeply. He has been, you know, he was not the kid who fit in at school, right? You know, I was a school teacher. I was well known for having great classroom management you know, we had some wiggly boys. They would put them in my classroom. I could wrangle them. You know, I <laughs> then, you know, the Lord sends me this boy, <laughs> I guess, to teach me I can't control everything. And it's not the parents' fault all the time, right? And he just, you know, he started off loving, loving baby, loved his mama from day one. But he he always had a very strong personality when he started going to daycare he got kicked out of daycare after daycare he wasn't he wasn't the the fit and i'm like what <laughs> I, I you know i can teach other people's kids all day long and my own son is off at daycare getting kicked out of daycare <laughs> yeah, yeah we resemble that remark we're both the uh, dragon parent and the recipients of the dragon parents yeah right it was well, not easy and and it felt very like, like I said, it's like the good Lord sent me this boy to teach me that, first of all, I couldn't control anything, but then some things don't need to be controlled. And, yeah. and that was also a very important lesson. And, you know, learning to love a, a, a son that did not fit the mold and didn't always follow society's norms and realizing some of the things that may have seemed like his biggest weaknesses, right, were actually because of his great gifts and strengths. And, you know, we're trained as a society, as teachers, educators, just parents in general, you know, that we want a certain kind of compliant behavior. You know, you want to groom your child to be the valedictorian. Of course, valedictorians rarely go on to do anything great in life, but <laughs> that's actually true. Is it really? Did you know that? No. Is that true? Yeah. 
it is it's fascinating valedictorians high school valedictorians rarely go on to change the world now if if you've got children that are valedictorians people who are listening if you were a valedictorian nothing against you it takes a lot of intelligence and dedication to be a valedictorian but valedictorians play the game really really well they're not out there challenging the status quo oh so if you want to change the world you hire yourself some valedictorians in other words maybe yeah they're going to do a real good job for you and your company but they're not the ones out there and i I know there have got to be examples of valedictorians who went on to do amazing things and challenge the status quo but in general you know people who play the game of school well are not going to go out there and break boundaries because they're playing the game well what are some of your son's talents well he um He's always been very creative and, you know, art and music have really come out in him as he got older. He went to a fine arts magnet school and our older son had been to that same magnet school and he ended up in the filmmaking program, which was a great fit for him. He was, he was also creative. My left brain child is also very creative too, but he went to Georgia Tech and got a 4 I mean, he's, he can play the game if he yeah. needs to, yeah. um, but when my son was was at Will, the younger one, went off to the fine arts school. There was a um, a six twelve school, public magnet school, and we didn't really know what his talent was going to be. We knew he, you know, he was great at playing the recorder in elementary school, for example. You know, he he skipped a grade in elementary school, um, but he he never really had you know like all the great grades just because he like didn't want to play that game yeah. and he was great in the the music program played the recorder they had recorder karate have you heard of that yes of course I taught it okay well I didn't know so yeah. that was like a universal thing but he got his black belt as a fourth grader you know yeah. I don't know but there were two fourth graders that got their black belt and he was a fourth grader who had skipped a grade so we're like I was like huh he's got some musical talent so when he went off to the fine arts school um you, you know you got to pick what his fine art was going to be without even really knowing and we we had signed him up initially for um the theater because he's very active he liked to build things climb things be up high I'm like this boy can build sets he's going to be great with that so we're there at orientation and we just happened to go into the music room to pick up our older son Cal who was there helping out or, or helping with the music teacher and he was playing the saxophone he was not good at the saxophone by the way not a good musician but Will walked in had never picked up a brass instrument mouthpiece. You you know how hard it is to make a sound on a brass instrument. I can't do do it. it. So he picked up just the mouthpiece, held it to his mouth. First try made the most beautiful sound you've ever heard. Somebody else in the room said, "Uh, Mr. Kennedy, that was the music teacher's name. You got to hear this. And we'll play it a few more times. And the music, the band director said, you need to sign him up for the band. (laughs) So we went back and we changed what we had signed him up for. And there he was in the band program. Um, And he did really, really well. This band, the school had um, an intermediate band or a beginning band, an intermediate band and a symphonic band. And as an eighth grader, you know, he started playing the trombone in sixth grade. As an eighth grader, he was already first chair of the symphonic band. Okay. And he went on, we lived in Georgia at the time. He went on to be, um, you know, governor's honors program for the trombone. He went on to be, you know, first chair, all state band. He made all state band every single year. I mean, he was just amazingly gifted with that. Mm-hmm. But then his senior year of high school, he said, I'm really, I'm done with the trombone. I'm done with that. And, and we didn't really know what he was going to do. He didn't know what he was going to do, but he had been accepted to Savannah college of art and design um and so he was going to go and kind of figure out what he wanted to do but he put that trombone down after his senior year of high school and he was done with that and it was like all right he's finished with that um and then he started he taught himself to play the guitar and then he started a band and then he dropped out of scad and you know he really really struggled as a creative person over the next few years not really knowing what he wanted to do and how are you going to make these creative endeavors pay the bills and then he had some had some issues with his band you know struggled with some addiction here and there but two years ago for whatever reason he picked up a paintbrush and he had never he'd been to this fine arts magnet school didn't take a single painting class there didn't do any art went to SCAD dropped out after a year and a quarter didn't really do much there but he picked up a paintbrush and started painting and he was like, okay, I love this. So now he is, he is painting. He's, um, 
experimenting with oil painting. He's doing some commissioned work for people here and there. And he is figuring out how to build a career in the arts. Wow. So he's really tried lots of different things. Yes. Yeah. He and he's got so many talents. You know, he it, it's hard when, when you're you got that multi-potentiality. You've got the things that you're good at. And yeah. You know, when, when you've got that artistic mind, you know this, you are just driven to create. Like, he still loves to write music. He still loves to to sing and play the guitar and and create music. But he's like his mama. But now that he's gotten 24 and gotten out of that teen, those teenage years, he's realized he likes to wake up early and go to bed early. You can't really be a rock star if you right. like to go to bed at 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, all the, all the, the cycles all change when you get out of your teenage years and you go back to being normal. With your right it's feet. true yeah. it's yeah. you can get up in the morning and paint but you can't get up in the morning and go do a rock show so. right no <laughs> no unless you take the winston churchill nap or something like that i guess so yeah. yeah well now you are not only a professional but you're a creative yourself because you have to be a creative to do podcasts and write books uh, yeah. let's talk a little bit about you how did you decide to become a podcaster well i just i'm a teacher right mm -hmm. and so i I am creative when it comes to teaching people things and I am great at, you know, I taught elementary school, like I said, for 28 years, yeah. I was a fantastic elementary math teacher. For example, I could teach math to the kids who thought they were bad at math. And it, you, fortunately I got them when they were in elementary school before they had developed the internal dialogue. I can't do math. Cause you yeah. know, once you've got that in your head, I can't do math. It's really hard to, to, to go back, but I taught third grade for a lot of years and I was great at, at creatively teaching math to children because, I mean, math is, is a creative field, believe it or not. You may not realize that, but it, but it is. And like I said, my son that's the computer programmer, the older one that's the left brain kid, he's also very creative. So he can creatively, you know, write his computer programs and yeah. all of that. So I am a creative in the way that I am great at teaching people things and, you know, coming up with analogies that help people understand things, that sort of a thing. But to be a creative person is one thing. To make a living at the creative thing you do is very different. And that is what you did. Yes. You, uh, you know, you could have stayed a teacher and had the safe salary and then been creative with your teaching. But you said, this is what I creatively do. How can I monetize this? How can I turn it into something I can do all the time? How did you do that? Well, and I also want to be honest with something about that. Teaching is no longer the creative profession that it was when I started. I started teaching in 1990. And back in the day, we really could be creative about what we were doing. But when I left the profession in 2018, it had gotten to the point that it, it really wasn't a creative profession anymore because everything, you know, the whole no child left behind period of time, you know, the motivations were good. And I saw some very positive things come out of that legislation in that we no longer ignored our special needs kids. We no longer said, you can't learn because you've got this diagnosis. We're going to put you in a room somewhere that we no longer did that. But the unintended consequence was that we suddenly were hyper-focused on test scores. And the way I saw that come out in the classroom was um, everybody was expected to really be lockstep. And, you know, we, we had a goal. It was this test score that you had to get your kids to have. And the way you got there was we were going to tell you how to get there. It was no longer like, you know, your kids and you know how they need to learn and you can creatively reach each of them. It was no, here's what you're going to do. And here's how you're going to do it. Like there were principals in our school system that had, they, they said, if, if I'm doing evaluations on the third grade hall at nine o'clock and I walk from one classroom to the next classroom Every teacher on that hall should be on the same page and at the same point in their lesson. It's like that and, Madeline Langle book where every Well, the, the yes, I, A Wrinkle in Time. Yeah. Oh my Lord, I hadn't thought about that. But yes, it yeah. really, and I, that sounds bizarre, but that was really the expectation from these principals. And so it's not a creative profession. And we saw people who were new teachers who had been, you know, we had someone come to work with me in my gifted program and she was so sweet and she loved the kids and she was great with them. But I was like, okay, this is my curriculum. This is what I'm doing with them. And she was like supplementing with them with the gifted program. And I'm like, you get to decide what you do with them. She didn't know how to write a lesson plan. Because yeah. when she graduated from college and had been at schools, they were always like, here's what you do and here's how you do it. So she didn't know how to, how to do that. So 
all that to be said, you know, I was ready to leave education when I did because it was no longer, you know, giving me the feeling of this is a creative career that I can be in my classroom and, and I can be trusted as a professional with this many years experience in a doctorate and a master's degree and a track record of like having the best third grade test scores in the entire, you know, school. Right. And yet I'm not trusted to, to know the best way to teach my students anymore. And mm-hmm. so it, it was, it was time to go. And I was so lucky I'm very, very fortunate that I had begun the work with intermittent fasting because I I didn't begin it as a career. I didn't begin it as a way to earn money. I started it because I was obese. I I needed to lose a lot of weight. I lost 80 pounds, like you said at the beginning. And it was basically, you know, I'm one of those people that when something works, I like to tell everybody about it. So I started a very small Facebook group for me and my friends who wanted to know, well, how did you lose weight, Jen? Jen? And so I just started it because I was like, well, this worked for me. I'd like to support other people that are going through it. And over the years, like after I'd been running that Facebook group for about a year and it had grown and grown and grown, people that I didn't know were suddenly joining it. We had you know, a few thousand members. I'm like, we really need a book, a book that we, that I can, because people are like, how do I start? What do I do? And there was not a book I could send them to that had all the information I wanted them to know. <laughs> and the teacher in me, right, I can create curriculum. So I created a book and that was my first book, Delay, Don't Deny, and I self-published it um, at the end of 2016. And, you know, you you understand what it means to be in the flow, yeah. you know, as an, as an artist. I was so in the flow. A friend of mine who's very woo-woo and spiritual, she said, you downloaded that book. And I, I very much feel like that's what happened. I mean, I just, oh. from the moment I conceived of that book and started writing it, like I would wake up in the middle of the night and like start, you know, and, and have to get the words out, you know, cause they were, they were coming out of me and it's still very much in my voice, but, um, yeah, you know, me, it just, it came, it came out. I wrote that book in a very short time, but it just, and you know, it still sells to this day. And I, I'm still proud of how that book turned out, but it was, again, it was to teach people about intermittent fasting and to have a place to send them mm-hmm. and like read this. And, the, you know, in, empowering them to to make the journey their own. That was really my goal with that. It was, it was, again, to be just to be a teacher. And then over time, you know, my little book started to sell and the, the sales, you know, kept going up. And I remember in about August, I think it was August of 2016, sitting at the dinner table with my family. And I said, my book sold a thousand copies last month. And everybody's just looking at me like, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> but you know, when you, when you put the math together of self-published, book, that was like $7,000 yeah. to yeah. me from, from this self-published book, you know, what a school teacher salary is like. And I'm like, this self-published book is paying me more than my school teacher salary mm-hmm. was paying me. And I was like, I wonder if this book will continue to sell and if it will allow me to full-time devote myself to intermittent fasting and and spreading the word about intermittent fasting. And um, sure enough, that that's what, what has happened in 2017. Someone just happened to show up early 2017 in my Facebook group and said, anyone want to start a podcast with me? And coincidentally, I had just been on a podcast for the first time ever, like the week before someone who was in the Facebook group had like a political podcast. I don't even think he's still creating it. I don't even know what that was about, but he said, would you come on my podcast, talk about fasting? I said, okay. And I was okay. I did all right on it. And so when this person popped in and said, anyone want to do a podcast? I was like, sure. And that was how the intermittent fasting podcast got started. I'm no, no longer on that one, but we, we had that one together for five years before I went my, my own direction. But it all just kind of started to fall into place. And then it was early, you know, you have to think about the timing of that, The this was early intermittent fasting was kind of gaining traction, but I think to be an early voice and to have a very realistic explanation of intermittent fasting, I think that that really helped. You've talked about a lot of things. I want to paraphrase them and break them up. Okay. First of all, you're a creative person in a profession, a profession, a teaching profession. Right. And the profession initially allows you to be the creative person you want to be. 
um, you, the profession starts closing down on you and you can no longer be the person you want to be. So you move into something that allows you to be what you want to be part time. You say, okay, right. this is harder for me to be the person I want to be. I think I'll be the person I want to be over here when I can do it. Then you have a mission that drives you to improve that. Uh, you had something that was really driving you. It was your weight loss. It was the intermittent fasting. I want to share this and I have the skills to do it. The mission drove you to continue to succeed. And as you succeeded, you were paying attention. You had that business mind and you were saying, hey, this is working and how could I continue to make it work so that I can use this to support me in my mission? Always the mission and always the creative mind at work. So um, I say these things because, you know, you are a, a teacher and a parent of a, of a child who wants to be creative. Uh, can you see uh, how you can teach your child some of the things he might need to know to follow in your footsteps doing what he wants to do? He's in a world which may not support his creative endeavors. How can you help him? That's a great question. You did a wonderful job summarizing that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, that's, that's the tricky part. And, you know, when you're, when you're creative and you just want to do that thing that you love, but you still have to earn money in the world and trying to come to terms with that, especially when you're young and like, well, I don't want to go to work and work at the holiday inn. You know, I don't want to go yeah. do that, but you got to pay the bills. You know, do you have to do something that pays the bills and figuring out a way to make money from something that is creative, I think is a challenge that creative people have been faced with you know, from the beginning, you know, having to, to monetize what you're doing is, is not easy. You just want to do the pure form of the art for the love of doing it. But then you have to think, well, you know, I've got to have a way to, to pay the bills. So my role is, you know, to help him figure out, you know, what do you really love? What do you love? And then, you know, some days when he's complaining about, well, I had to go to work and then I was too tired to go home and paint. And then I'm like, but you're not, you don't work seven days a week, you know, just kind of helping him see, that life is a series of, you know, figuring out what you want to do and, and understanding that even if you love something, you're not going to love every minute of it. Like, let's talk about Taylor Swift, for example. I, I am not someone who follows Taylor Swift. I couldn't sing a Taylor Swift song for you right now if you paid me to do it. I don't, I don't know her work. I've had teenage boys. I didn't grow up listening. I mean, I, they didn't grow up listening to Taylor Swift. I didn't listen to it either. We were listening to the Beatles at our house, but she is living a very successful career, but I guarantee there are parts of it that feel like drudgery to her. You know, she, you, you, her audience can't tell when she gets up, gets up on the stage and does an amazing concert, but I bet you there's days she's not feeling it, you know, and that, that's the reality of really any job, any job that you've got. You know, I love the work I'm doing in the intermittent fasting world. There are days that I have a 9 a.m. podcast interviewed scheduled and I might not be feeling it. I want to go out and sit on the beach that day. It's a beautiful day. But I'm like, you know, you have to you have to have discipline in your in your creative career as well. And so I get up and I get ready and I come over to my office space and I record the podcast. And I always love it when I'm doing it. But it's just a matter of understanding the you know, no matter what you're doing in life, and, and as a creative person, you just want to do those things that are in the flow that make you feel good. There is discipline required as you're, you know, doing the things like the business side of it. You know, I, I don't like to sit down and do the QuickBooks every month for my yeah. accountant, but I have to do it. So what, yeah, it, it's very easy for people to say have discipline, but the fact is the people who have discipline, they have it for a reason. Where right. does your discipline come from? Well, it's just a matter of realizing that things, there's certain things that have to be done. And I know everyone is different, but for me, I'm like, these are the things that must be done. You know, you have to live in the world and, you know, to live in the world, you have to pay your electric bill or yeah. marry somebody who's really good at paying the electric bill, right? You got to support people around you, but it's a matter of either, you know, knowing what you can do yourself that needs to be done. Or finding people to support you to do those things. I had to teach Will how to pay the electric bill and even how to interpret it, <laughs> how to understand yeah. it, you know, and things are hard. Yeah. So um, I want to continue to ask you this, though. 
but what okay. drives your discipline? What I mean, yes, it's it's a fact that you have to take care of things. Is that right? Is it that desire to take care of your family that's disciplining you? If your family you was mean, not for there, me would you... personally, well, let's start with you because you have okay. to model for your your son. You have to be able to teach your son. Um, I'm not saying that what's what what drives you is what will drive him, but let's start with what drives you. Where does your discipline come from? Well, I guess it's just because growing up knowing that there are just certain things you do and you have to have, there are certain things you have to accomplish. And again, you know, I talked about it earlier, you know, playing the game. You can choose to play the game to the level that you're willing to play it, but everybody has to play the game to some degree. I can remember when Will was middle school, high school aged. I think they read like Walden or something. One of those, those books where, you know, he's living out in the, on the lake. And he's like, I just want to go out and live on a lake and live off the land and not have to, you know, conform to society. And I'm like, well, that all sounds really good. But right now the land is all owned by somebody. You can't just go like stake out a claim on a lake yeah. anymore. That's not how it is. And, you know, understanding that the world is set up in a way that maybe isn't how you wish it was set up, but you have to learn to work within those parameters. So you have an internal voice basically that tells you this reality. It yeah. says, you know, well, I'd love to sit on the beach, but my internal voice is telling me, you know, you got to do it. I guess exactly. it seems like you are now having to be that internal voice for your son and hopefully he will develop that internal voice as he grows. Is that accurate? Well, well yes. And he always has had the discipline to do the things he loves. Like when he, you know, I talked about him being first chair all state band, the year that he, he became first chair, he, before the school year started, he wrote a note on his musical stand and put it up there and said, first chair. So he's very goal driven, you know, mm -hmm. as a, as a gifted teacher, I, you know, we talk about kids being motivated and kids being unmotivated. And I've really never met an unmotivated kid. That being said, there are lots of kids that are motivated to do different things than I would want them to be motivated to do. And that's where, that's where the trick is. Everyone is motivated by something. So, you know, Will was highly motivated to be first year all state band. And he put in the work and the practice. We went on a cruise that, that year for our spring break. Okay, we're on a cruise ship. Are you going to play the trombone on a cruise ship? No. Did he bring his trombone anyway? Yes, because he was like, I cannot not practice. So he's out there on the balcony playing his trombone. I'm like, all right. He, he really, really cares. He was highly, highly motivated. Now, this is the same child, his um, senior year of high school. He had already been accepted to SCAD and he only needed to pass English to graduate. Now, he knew this and I knew this and he'd already been accepted to SCAD. His guidance counselor calls me in about December and he said, uh, Miss Stevens, <laughs> William is only passing English. He's failing everything else. I am banned. He was passing banned. And I said, now, let me just get this straight. He only has to pass English to graduate, right? And she said, yes. And I said, thank you. I mean, I, I was not going to be able to motivate him to pass, you know, chemistry. What, he he right. did not see the, the need for that. He was highly unmotivated when it came to chemistry. And, you know, there are people who are listening. They're like, why didn't you just punish him and make him do better in those classes? Well, they don't know this boy of mine, my, my yeah. older son. Punishment worked beautifully for him. Again, he's the one who went on to have a 4 0 at Georgia Tech. If I had one child, I would be like, look what a great mother I am. I just say, get, get A's. Yeah, they get A's. Second child, I'm like, you need to do well. I told, gave him the same deal that I gave with his older brother. I'm like, here, if you get these grades, I will do this and this and this. And he went, thought about it and said, yeah, not worth it. <laughs> and I'm like, what? what? You're not supposed to be able to think for yourself like what? that. You don't understand the Zell Miller scholarship. <laughs> you can go to college for free. What? And he's like, yeah, not worth it. So, you know, when, when you've got kids that are intrinsically motivated to do certain things and not other things, you just have to, you know, guide them the best you can. And we couldn't punish that spark out of him, no matter what we did. So I had to learn how to work with him and help him, you know, figure out how to live in the world that wasn't really designed for him. He would be much happier by a lake living off the land on yeah. his own. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, now, this is your son, and it's always right. harder to teach your children oh, than yeah. it is to teach your students. Were you able to apply? I mean, of course, as you said, you had students who weren't motivated, and you had a whole basket of tricks that you could use to motivate them. Were you able to use any of these motivations from your students on your son 
because you had done it with them. No. No. Didn't work at all. No. Seriously. One one of my greatest gifts as as a teacher was understanding how the kid the kids were all different and what motivated one wouldn't motivate the other. Like I can remember as a third grade math teacher, um, you know, you know, as a teacher, there are some kids who are really motivated by, motivated by grades and some that are not. Some kids just you have to figure out what makes them tick. Like I can remember this little fella in my third grade class. He just wanted to be done with his math test, turn it in, then go do something else. So you can imagine he would turn in his math test and you got like. 20% of it correct. But I knew he could do it because he'd shown me he could do those things already. So I would be like, here's a whole brand new test. Take your time, do it again. And he, so he would maybe at this time he's 40% correct. I'm like, nope, you can, here's a whole brand new one. Like I wasn't like, go redo this one, fix the mistakes. No, I'm like, here's a brand new one. I can do this all day. You're going to keep taking this math test until you, you show me what you can really do. Cause I know you can do it. So by the time this kid's taking this math test four times, he's like, if I'd have just taken it right the first time, <laughs> then I would be done. So then from for the rest of the year, this child is more careful about his math test. On the flip side, little Miss Susie Q perfect over there doesn't really do her best on the math test. She gets like an 87 or something, right? Which to her is like, uh, not an A. And she's like, can I have a whole new test and do it again? I'm like, nope, you're stuck with an 87. <laughs> She needed something different. She needed the punishment of an 87. She didn't want to get that again. So the next time she was a lot more careful. Whereas little fella over here, he didn't care if he got a 20. He just want. So you have to figure out what motivates them. What motivates this child of mine is his own mind. <laughs> Not me. I mean, yes, he's motivated by, you know, parental love and, and wanting to, wanting to please because even when you march to the beat of your own drummer, you do want to please your parents, want your parents to love you. But we, we you know, you're not going to conditionally you know, add that. I'm only going to love you if you get A's. No. So he knew that we would love him no matter what. But he's just the most intrinsically motivated person that I, I've ever known. And he's got to really want to do something. And those are the kids that are, like I said, not motivated by punishment because they, you know, they, they value what they value. Yeah. 